Good evening. You probably heard why I turned the sound off just as we ended the sitting. Unlike Shingiroshi, who has a very nice soundscape around her abode in Syracuse with birds and the wind and thunderstorms. This is a busy street corner here and a lot of things happen. So that's why I put my fake ears on so you, I can hear you, I can see you and you can hear me as well. Tonight, uh, Jingiroshi is participating in a conference over Zoom uh, of the American Zen Teachers Association. And the host is giving a talk tonight about non-duality, the non-dual Dharma. Very interesting. And while Roshi gets to listen to that and participate in it, we actually got to do it just before uh, I started breaking it up with all kinds of sounds and now with words. So Roshi asked me to give a talk tonight and what could we talk about that makes a good connection between our experience in the world, the experience of what we call the current times and the practice in which we engage. And it is very important from my own experience and from my point of view that, um, that we make that connection between practice, action, and what we call our daily lives. So going back to the fact that we are in a Buddhist practice. It's after all, it's called Zen Buddhism. And we, we very proudly state that this practice is the practice of the Buddha. This is not necessarily the practice that follows exactly the letter of the word of the Buddha that is taken down in various scriptures, in commentaries of scriptures, in sutras and so on. No, but the same practice that the Buddha did, we do. The same humanity the Buddha manifested by being a human being, we investigate as he did. So one of these teachings of the Buddha is the teaching of Pratitya Samutpada. I suppose you have heard about it before. Pratitya Samutpada. In Japanese, it's called Engi. Engi. And it is the teaching of interdependent origination of everything that exists. Some of us who are experienced in various kinds of Buddhism know that in the Tibetan, in the Vajrayana tradition, there are very nice artworks that are made up to illustrate the teachings of the Buddha. And one of them is the wheel of life, or sometimes it's also called the wheel of deluded existence. And you all probably can remember it. And if you don't, uh, go on the internet. You have access to it because you're watching here. So, and look for that wheel. It has a very, very important visual aspect of us connecting to everything that is happening with our practice and everything that is happening in our world. So when we look at that wheel, in the very, very center of the wheel, we have the three animals, which I talk about sometimes. One is a boar, and the boar is nipping the tail of a snake. 
and the snake is biting the tail feathers of a rooster and the rooster connects to the tail of the boar. So these three motors inside that wheel, of course, they stand for the three poisons as the Buddha described it. And as we go further out in the wheel, there are various depictions of the various realms that exist in the Buddhist cosmology. And then around the rim, there are 12 stages, 12 little segments, just like on a clock. So between 12 o'clock and one, one and two, and so on until the whole outside is filled in with those segments. And these segments describe Pratitya Samutpada, the codependent origination. So let's look at the various pieces in here. It might be quite informative. I don't want to use the world. Maybe, maybe illuminating is a good word. The first one is ignorance. It's depicted in a traditional way, showing a blind person with a cane. How often have you found yourself? How often do I find myself just in that kind of condition? Yes, standing upright, being in this world, but not being able to see using a cane as to find out about the world in a kind of second-hand manner. Not being able to see and not being able to make the actual experience is something that is quite a common human experience that we have. So, Second one, mental formations. When we look at it, it's depicted as a potter spinning the wheel and forming pots out of clay. And what that is meant to depict and teach us about is that whatever we do with whatever we get in contact with, our actions mold the results. Like the potter makes out of something that has no shape, something that has form and even has function. Now for a potter, it's a nice thing to make pots, but it could be a blacksmith. And there it's maybe a little bit more clear to see that if that black, blacksmith were to make swords, these actions radiate outward. Whatever we do with that, what we receive in this moment, in what actions we set, there will be results. That was the second link of Engi, it's a chain. And in that chain, in the traditional Theravadan interpretation, the first two links are the links that describe past causes. The next links, three through seven, are the links that talk about present effects that come from those past causes. And the first one, of course, is consciousness. Consciousness, very interestingly, is depicted in the traditional Tibetan way as a monkey in a tree. We all have consciousness and we all make relationship with that monkey in the tree quite often. Jumping from here to there, being restless, having an object of fascination, shrieking, <laughs> just like that. 
the monkey in the tree, the mental formations that lead to consciousness. The element of restlessness is very important here. To see that restlessness, not as something that is unfounded, but it is part of the movement of consciousness and of that chain of Pratitya Samudpada. The fourth one sometimes is called mind and matter, but we could also say name and form. It is depicted as four persons sharing a boat, four people in a boat. And the four people stand for the four aspects of the activities of feeling, of discrimination, of the compositional factors and of consciousness that leads to name and form, to the objectification, to the ability to distinguish between a rope on the ground and a snake. But at the same time, the ability to discriminate in a way that is harmful. It is an inherent link of that chain. Name and form. Now, once those names exist and the form comes into existence, we deal with the six senses. The six senses. The traditional five and the mind. And that depiction in the traditional way is a house, an empty house with hollow windows through which the wind blows in and out. The house is empty. It's not inhabited. Consciousness as such is a natural function like gravity that just works. As my ordination teacher, Joshu Roshi used to say, without will and desire. Ishi yokyo nashi. Without will and desire, the six windows in the empty house. Now we get to link number six contact. Here we go. This is where our Western prude people encountering the art of Tibet and of India first were a port because it shows an amorous couple. Something very natural. It is the point in which object senses, so name and form, senses, consciousness, meet through those six windows in the empty house. And what that creates in the Buddhist uh, cosmology is one nen, one of those little nens, one of those little moments that comes into existence. Nen after nen, nen after nen. Again, Joshu Roshi uh, taught about these nen or these moments to be at a frequency that was described in the traditional Buddhist text as Hachiman Shisen, 84,000 times a second it happens. Now, of course, it's very hard for us people to just really believe that. So, because we can't see it. But in the same way, I try to explain sometimes, and today I will change that explanation a little bit. You're looking at the screen here. And it looks like there's a picture that is moving and everything. But you know, it's just a sequence of a limited number of still images that our mind puts together. And we see time, we think there's time, we, we think there's movement. But really at the frequency maybe of 60 or 50 times per second, these pictures change. But we are not in a place with our mind our six holes in those walls of the empty house cannot keep up with even 60 
times per second. Now imagine 84,000 times a second. This world disappears and comes into existence. One Nen after another Nen. The seventh link, and it's the last one of the present effects, is the Nen of feeling. It's called feeling because it can be said there is pleasure, there's pain, and everything else we look at as indifferent. In one of my last talks, I talked about indifference a little bit. So that is where this happens here on this feeling link of Pratitya Samutpada of Engi. And feeling is depicted by a person with an arrow in their eye. You look at it, 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 it hurts to look at it. But that's what it is. That's where the, the arrow meets the eye and where then this very quick decision is made. I like, I don't like, Ugh, I don't care. It's important that we know that that feeling, again, is something that is built into our, into our psyche. It's built into the process of the consciousness of a human being. It doesn't mean that we can't train it. And that's why we are here together in this practice. That's why we sat together in silence without engaging in this discriminating feeling of saying, this is good, this is bad this I don't care about. There's no need for that. That arrow already has hit the eye before this determination is made in the consciousness of a self. So we have to be very clear about that from the beginning. There must be a self in order to cut the world into those three areas of I like, I don't like, I don't care. And that self now, of course, you can say pleasure and liking is not bad, but we have to be a little more careful here and look even a little deeper into the self. And that's what we also do in Zazen. What is that self? Why is it that this arrow at one point is recognized as something that is pleasurable at other points as indifferent or even as painful. That's a very, very important investigation in Zazen. And one hint is, well, this self, this self that claims I am, is the self that has these rules to decide what it likes and what it doesn't like. And often those rules become just mechanistic. And what we can say in general, whatever is affirming the existence of that separate self identity will be put into the bucket of, I like, this is affirming myself. Anything that doesn't unconditionally affirm the self will be seen as negative. It's a threat. We don't want it. And that which neither affirms nor negates is that area of indifference. So now, uh, of course, what will a fixated self, a self do that wants to have more of the good stuff? It's the next link. It leads to craving. Craving, knowing very well from the very beginning that there will be that which doesn't unconditionally affirm ourselves. We will have difficulties. We will have pain. We will experience difficulties. But it is exactly that that creates that craving. That craving, and it is depicted by a person drinking wine. We all know that 
the biggest intoxication and the most addictive intoxication that humanity suffers from is the intoxication of ego. We all here and there have that ego hangover. And then when we are cured, we go for the bottle again. That is craving. And with craving starts the part of the chain of Pratitya Samutpada that uh, speaks about present causes. So craving in the moment, which means unconditional affirmation of a separate self is one of the causes in this very moment that creates, again, new outcomes, new effects from our actions. It's not only that we crave, but we grasp. That bottle of wine needs to be grasped and we hold onto it as long as it is full. So attachment and grasping is depicted by a person plucking fruit out of the tree. We like to harvest. We like to claim the fruits that the world so freely provides, but we wanna hold on to them. And I think there should be a straight line from this into the center where you find greed, anger, and delusion. The greed factor of attachment is very much the basis of almost all the problems that we experience in the moment where we have haves and have nots. Attachment to possession, grasping of pleasure, all of that makes this world very difficult at times. The next one, we are at number 10. Here comes becoming. Becoming that what will unfold through our current manifestations, through our current actions. It is the creation of new conditions. It is depicted by a pregnant woman a woman bearing a future life. It also points already to existence, existence. The mother exists already. There is no difference between the mother and the child. This present and the future that will be born from this present are not different. So even though for our two-dimensional mind, that we speak of past causes, present effects, present causes and future effects. There is really no difference. It's just an explanation that allows us to see the various aspects of this polydimensional life that we experience. So existence covers the place where these conditions play out in this very moment. The last two links that we have in this wheel of Pratitya Samutpada in the chain is birth. It's very easy to guess how it is depicted. It is depicted as a woman giving birth to a child. The dependent arising of birth is the teaching that nothing, no thing, everything, each thing, the 10,000 things arise out of conditions. There is no arising that is unconditional. But with that, the last link, brings us to aging and death, showing 
a person, a first young, then hunched over, getting old, again on a cane. And in the end, on the pyre, ready to be burned. Dependent arising of aging and death. All that arises will perish, will transform. The future effects of birth, aging and death. Sometimes we also describe as the activity of impermanence. Mujo in Japanese. So now we have this wonderful picture here in front of us. What can it teach us? Why is it so important? Especially in times where we see strive in all kinds of forms and shapes and difficulties in our society. Why does the Buddha teach about all of that? And why are we looking into this? Why can't we just like convenient, conveniently forget about all of this and say, let's move on? Zen practice teaches us that we must know, we must explore that what has brought us to this now. What is it that has brought us to this now? It's conditions. Conditions, you might want to call it karma. Conditions through which that what is arises, through which that what is disappears. Engi, Paditya Samutpada, speaks to that. It speaks to it in a way that we, for our individual development, for our individual exploration and the exploration of humanity and what it means to be a human being is that means we have to look into that and see how these processes work out within ourselves. So that when we go out in the world, when the potter comes into play and we make pots, that we are fully based upon an awakened view and manifestation of these actions so that it will lead to a place where it's not just let's forget about history. This is so long ago. So that we can actual, actually make a difference that is the basis for the new conditions to arise. I'm not saying anything against doing what we can. Of course, we have to do what we can in this phenomenal world to help. We have to do that. But from the Buddhist point of view and from the point of view of somebody who is engaged in the exploration of humanity, of, uh, of this universe, from having been as a human, being born as a human being, it is really, really important that we don't do it in a way that we just replace one inconvenient delusion with a little bit more benign delusion. It's wonderful to make incremental steps and to help this world to get to a point where conditions in the outward world change. But if it's just an outward change, and we don't inspire ourselves and others to dig deep and see through that what it means to be a human being, then it's just another step into a different level of delusion. So, Engi, Engi speaks to there is no self. It speaks to emptiness. There is no fixated anything. It means we can change. We change all the time, but we have to become more apt. Again, the potter, 
in forming the actions from a point of acting that is illuminated by the deep knowledge that there is no self and there is no separation. Our individual lives are interconnected in a way that there, there are not my conditions, your conditions. There is no such thing. Each and every condition is a condition that is just now, in this very moment that unfolds. And this is the chance that we have to initiate a difference in all levels of the phenomenal world. No I, no you, we all together, this planet, this universe, all of this is yourself. So let's dig into that and let's do it with an open heart and with a smile on our face and not leave anything out but open our arms wide to embrace with our white clothes the most stained thing that we can imagine and still make it our child.